I, I got to a review of about five minutes through the last recording and I realized the well I realized but came to remembrance of scripture which is uh, Pauline of course um, you should obey authority you know they're put over us and you obey them now that's an astonishing cut across free will isn't it it's definitely the emphasis on obedience and it's not even obedience to God it's obedience to um, leaders which you're um, taking to be leaders because God has some leaders over you and they're not even godly leaders I mean they're the state we're talking about you know it's it's Pharaoh or it's uh, it's um, the Roman Emperor you know it, it's Parliament uh, whether you like what they're saying or not and Paul's saying I know it's most important that you learn obedience and I'm putting obedience above all that there has to be a harmony you're not at war with the state you can't be at war with your own cell group you know you obey your parents you obey your uh, society leaders or the system that puts them there you you, you support you know you, you are legal you you keep legality and and this has been in tremendous tension with but hang on the world is secular and it has all sorts of very evil intentions at times and I'm supposed to support this and be part of it surely not you know I rebel there's tremendous rebellion in me here you know um, I'm not doing that that my love is not simply obedience is to influence for good that in some sense I'm I'm compelled by my devotion to God to actually challenge Paul on the issue that now I'm supposed to be obeying God not man not the state the state is forever dominated by children you know those that don't have a very good view of God well like myself it's incomplete and they're therefore requiring of me something that I do not actually believe is the will of God am I to do God's will or the state's will you know am I to rebel or am I to run the concentration camp because Hitler's insisting on it what am I to do I'm in a dilemma I think the Nuremberg trials were on the principle that, well, were you really compelled to do it, or did you do it of your own volition? If you were compelled to do it, which is what they argued, of course, bureaucratic speech, um, uh, we have to do it. The law requires it. Um, we even classify them as, you know, a bit like farmers. They don't think of the animal as an animal. They refer to it as stock. It's not a feeling individual. It's stock. It's the resource that we're running our business on and, and, and given that mindset I make these decisions that are consistent with running the farm uh, running the concentration camp whatever I've been commissioned to do by the pressures of society and the needs for a living and so on and the Nuremberg trials were based on well did he do it because he had to do it or did he do it because he chose of his own free will? Well, of course, I assume there was free will. And, you know, yes, I've got free will. I've got free will to be enslaved by the sins I'm, you know, he that committed sin is the servant of sin. In what sense do I have free will? The whole point is I'm not free. I need to be released from whatever's dominating me, this evil spirit or, you know, you know the run of thought, don't you? So we separate out, we say, yes, the eternal of God, we have to be in harmony with. We love God. The chaos and destruction of uh, ignorance, of uh, an incomplete view of God. Uh, you've got to have a tolerance to it, but a strange intolerance that puts it at a distance that protects the godly from it that protects 
your pursuit of God from such chaos. You know that the state is, um, in some sense, the emblem of civilization, but in as far as it's secular and ungodly, it's the very essence of chaos, destruction, and inharmony. Uh, so where am I? Well, there's two responses. One is complete obedience, and um, well, there's a great te tendency to lose sight of God in such that you're obeying the state and the economic system and you know, I have to acquire wealth and I have to be obedient to um, things that I don't approve of morally. Hmm, doesn't sound too good. Somehow you've got to put this at a distance. And if you swing the other way to the other extreme, then of course you're the martyr who dies for his devotion to God, his principles. And the state is the one that martyrs him. You know, society stones him to death or uh, has him assassinated in the night. It's a rather more acceptable method. Acceptable to such corrupt powers that be. The alternative is the ascetic, uh, which to some extent is the monk or the priest who simply disengages from society in the sense that um, he finds, like Jesus, a situation where he can exist basically on the beach, by the lake, out in the wilderness, like John the Baptist perhaps, talking to people, you know, three days out, a long way away from the shops. <laughs> There's no food out here. <laughs> you can't stay too long unless you're going to uh, live pretty rough, pretty meanly. Um, people that detach themselves from society and then follow God as a priority and reach into the society in as far as it allows them to do so. You know, you go evangelizing on the streets too much and, um, well, you get locked out and put in the happy houses being loony, uh, which is a convenient way of simply getting you out of the way and stopping you doing what you're doing that's aggravating the, the local culture and society. It saves them stoning you to death. They um, drug you up and uh, uh, keep you marginalized in that way. We've labelled you as ill. <laughs> Good. We can come to your rescue. Here, take these drugs compulsorily or we'll force them down your throat. Um, mm. Such is the domain of the happy house. Let's not be too cynical here. That's, um, that's not a very godly attribute, is it? There is a tension, a great tension between Obedience, learning obedience, and being obedient, and to whom you're called upon to be obedient. Um, we're not called upon to be obedient. That's the whole point, isn't it? We're actually called upon to be loving. Has Paul missed this in his advice? Well, we hesitate before we say um, scripture is in any sense uh, <clears throat> fallible, imperfect, makes mistakes. Although we admit that the translations are, some of them are very dodgy. <laughs> we don't want to admit that perhaps um, well, the writers were dodgy too. Although we do take it that in some sense Paul is not the giant that Jesus is in the Gospels. 
I mean the triumph of um, the epitome of godliness. Perhaps we do. Perhaps you do take it as such. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Either way, it makes no difference. I have to incorporate a harmony, a practiced harmony between you and me. Or at least I have to practice and learn from attempting such, because such is fundamental in the kingdom of heaven. I must know and understand love and the necessary prerequisites for love. Well, we know the necessary prerequisite for being in heaven, uh, in a condition, and that is that you have a love that can embrace the variety of individuality that is in heaven. Now, how much of a mix God allows there, actually inside as opposed to outside, left in the creations like our one here in space and time, on earth, so to speak. How much is left out and how much is actually in the kingdom of heaven, we're not clear on. There is this tension then between individuality and harmony that is solved to some extent by heaven putting the things of this world at a distance or at least at a distance from the view of the things of this world. We are saying that God is present, uh, omnipresent, everywhere. Um, it's just that the consciousness of him by the people here, the children here, is, um, is not necessarily embracing that understanding. So they can live a life here of neglecting uh, the possibility of God's existence even. It's a place where you can do your thing and you learn the consequences accordingly and you know this this classroom trains you in trains you up to a harmony that's sufficient for you to enter the kingdom of heaven and be no risk there to yourself or anyone else. You're not going to be introducing evil, harm. You are introducing an individuality that you have and that you have gained, that you've learnt and experienced in this, uh, I say classroom here, but it's more like an apprenticeship. It becomes more like an apprenticeship when you get to know the teacher rather well and perhaps you live with him um, and you understand his view of life and uh, you start to know even the way he coughs in the morning <laughs> like dad sometimes I cough in a certain way that dad used to clear his throat and I think oh that's just how dad used to do and I know how he was and felt and his being when he did it because of course in some sense I'm my father's son aren't I well not too much so I'm born again I hope I don't want to make uh, the same disastrous mistakes that I I see that well all of us make I'm not condemning him but for the grace of God we would still be like it and in some degree I'll still like it that's why we're still here so we don't want to be too complacent, do we? And we're not, I hope. But you haven't answered, Marshall, this tension between obeying the state and obeying God. Well, I think I have. It's to um, find a, a niche in this state that you're living in and you're um, benefiting from the civilization such as it is that it's giving and it's infinitely better than anarchy and chaos. 
Well, you're benefiting from it, so you're trying to find a niche in it that's acceptable to the state, but leaves you your freedom to obey God. Um, as regards, I don't know about freedom, to, your freedom to love God and to love the people in the state. You're trying to find a niche in society that allows you to do that. It might be that you go into the ministry to do it. It might be you become a monk. Or you become uh, a recluse in a way that's... Mm, well, it's just not very interesting to society in general. You're not a problem. You can do that if you want. You're retired, are you? Yeah, well, okay, you're not working now and we accept you. Probably wouldn't be terribly useful now if you were, you're not physically up to it, or you won't be for long, or, um, yeah, we can live with that. You can be retired. Um, we even do it almost with unemployment. We should do it rather more, but we say, well, he can't get a job, we don't want him to starve to death. We're happy to give him some very minimal level of existence, unemployment pay. Um, and help him with housing if that's really the cardinal problem he's struggling with to some extent anyway um, yeah okay we can do that you're not going to be seen as an enemy of society just because you're unemployed I mean some people see you as an enemy of society but I mean, you know I mean my Indian wife um, really was still struggling with the cultural thing of there's no such thing as retirement I mean just laziness, you, sh you should be working. <laughs> Maybe she was giving up work at a phenomenal rate herself. Very pleased to go down to um, three days a week from almost the very start of being married. And, um, oh, anyway, let's not go into that. <laughs> Get back to the point, Marshall. Mm. I think. And I don't know, but I think the solution is not to be martyred. God does not want you require; it doesn't require you to be crucified. Uh, one one crucifixion's enough. Uh, even that's too much for some of us. I mean, one just can't bear the thought of anyone suffering. So leave alone someone you love and care for. It's just terrible. And I should say, leave alone anyone we should be loving and caring for, which is everyone. But that pushes our limit, doesn't it? Hmm. We're here to learn. So, seek out that which helps you to learn most. The lessons won't be perfect. Um, you know, don't assume that um, your teacher in, at school is a, a perfect individual, he's just, well, he's, he's in a helpful role and, and the role he's performing is, is a blessing, meant to be a blessing. We are schooled by circumstances that have imperfections because we need to know the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And that includes even in, in the structure of what we're learning that evil can be and uncertainty endemic in everything we do and uh, in that sense we're in a battle against it but it's not a battle to be fought with um, anger and stress and violence and frustration and, and all the diseases that go with it but a, a battle that is of good thought of whatsoever is good and lovely think on these things of being transformed by seeing the goodness of God and coming to know God for this is life eternal to know thee the only true God don't mean I've necessarily got the answer for you but is in that sort of direction I feel and perhaps you feel that too
Thank you, Heavenly Father. To be clearer, though, um, you're to seek love and kindness. First commandment is love. Uh, it's not obedience. But having said that, to seek it to the utmost, you're going to need to be necessarily acceptable to where you are. We're not, God is not requiring you to be crucified for your faith. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, you know, he's the end of sacrifice. The abysmal, appalling flow of blood, thousands of creatures being slaughtered um, for sacrifice, utterly abhorrent. Horrific. Just ghastly picture. You are not cannon fodder. You are not meant to be burnt at the stake. That is not the will of God. You will, and I'm going to be very pragmatic here, you will compromise as much as is necessary. Um, and that might be pretty awful at times. Um, You'll be doing things that you don't really feel is right. But um, the consequence of not doing such things is too great. Too great on you personally, perhaps too great on the ones you love. Perhaps um, just too difficult for you. Don't think that God doesn't understand that. It's all part of the imperfections, uh, the world of good and evil that we're experiencing. Um, and incidentally, God's solution is to put things at a distance. He keeps out of the kingdom of heaven that which is just not acceptable. You know, too inharmonious to be tolerable by the love and the covering. And they're kept out. And there's a, an angel there with a flaming sword on at the gates of Eden to keep those that would come in out that should not be in. Yes, seems to say something. But you can seek to love, you can seek to follow God within constraints to some extent, and they're flexible even. Um, you know, there are uh, as I say, you know, places in society that are not seen as threatening to society and do allow you great opportunity to love God and do what you think is right. So you seek out those positions, those, those places. And... And as far as you find such, you find a freedom to be as godly as you wish to be. And to the extent you don't, well, you have a longing to be, hopefully. And, um, well, you find ways around the obstacles so that you can be godly. And, and also accepting the fact that you don't need to change the world. God is master of all things. Uh, the world is doing very well for what the world is meant to be doing, which is training people in the experience of the knowledge of the fruit of good and evil. And that's very necessary for you to change fundamentally your being such that you seek godliness and not destruction. So, the world's doing very well from God's perspective. From the world's point of view, of course, it's got all a million imperfections and this should be this and that should be that and we shouldn't be tolerating so and so and we will rebel and we will change and we will, you know, go on the street and the whole world's going to bow before God and so on. No, it's not only individually, and uh, we do individually. 
Oh, there are many people that, um, you know, have not bowed before Baal, as was it in the Old Testament. 10,000 are still true. Uh, I think uh, whoever it was, the prophet was told. Not just you alone, Elijah. There are many others still that love me and still that, you know, well, in Old Testament terms, uh, bow before me and so on, and not corrupted. Yes, whatever. And I don't mean that dismissively, really. I mean, um, whatever the explanation is. Um, we have an almighty God who loves you. What is allowing in your life is therefore for blessing. And if it is for blessing, then it is by far the best to take hold of it in faith and say, thank you, Lord, that I do have this dilemma. Can't see the answer to it yet. I'm listening to you. I'm looking to you. I'm thanking you for the dilemma. I'm not even asking you to change it. But I could if it really gets on top of me. I'm allowed to ask. You know, that's all right. You understand. But I am seeking really to trust that you love me, are all powerful, and if you're allowing this problem, it's for a blessing. I can't see it yet, but it is my opportunity to trust you. So I'm going to thank you for it, Father. I don't feel too thankful, but I know I want to be. I want to trust you with all my heart, because I want to love you with all my heart. You put the stuff in me, and that's what counts. Well, I finally got there. I'm in tears. And thank you, Heavenly Father.